Our gentlemen, we are in the, hopefully this will be the final screencast for The Great Gatsby. Okay, so Nick has just left the owl-eyed man whose final words about Gatsby were just the poor son of a bitch, right? Nobody came to his funeral, poor, alone. Interesting use of poor here because poor is being meant as kind of pitiful or sad, but I mean, we can't help but read it as evoking the contrast between rich and poor. Okay, Nick takes us on this rather lengthy recollection he has. He talks about these vivid memories of coming back west from prep school and later from college at Christmas time. That's interesting. That actually tells us that Nick used to go east for prep school too. Places like, uh, you know, Exeter, Phillips Exeter, and, uh, you know, some of those other places that you know, the, the wealthiest and most privileged boys in the country would get to go to. So, anyway, he talks about coming back west. I know it's weird to think, you know, back west. He doesn't mean the west coast. He means back to his Midwest. And he's talking about being around Chicago in the wintertime, how cold it is, with great Midwestern... Uh, with great Midwestern uh, pride, he talks about the real snow, our snow. If you've ever been in snow in the Midwest compared to snow out east, you will understand why Midwesterners have real pride in their snow. Uh, Midwestern snow will give you feet, I mean feet of snow. East Coast snow, especially snow on the, in the cities like New York, Philly, Boston, Rhode Island, D.C., that snow doesn't really accumulate or stick very much, and usually as soon as the snowstorm is done, that snow all turns gray and slushy, and it's just a yucky mess. The Midwest actually looks like a beautiful winter wonderland when it snows. So, anyway, uh, Nick is giving us this whole account of the West, by which he means the Middle West, and then he comes down to this really interesting conclusion here where he tries to separate out the West from the East. He says, I see now that this has been a story of the West after all. Tom and Gatsby, Daisy and Jordan and I were all Westerners and perhaps we possess some deficiency in common which made us sub subtly unadaptable to Eastern life. That's interesting. It's interesting, of course, I mean, remember, Tom was from Chicago, Daisy's from Louisville, Jordan's also from Louisville, Gatsby is from Minnesota, North Dakota, and of course, Nick is from Chicago, Midwest area, all right? So none of them are actually Easterners. They're not really the old money East. They're, I mean, at least Tom and Daisy are old money Midwest, and so is Nick. Okay. Anyway... What, what really happens in these last pages, guys, is Nick starts to have some reflections on just what it meant to be East in general. What it meant, what, when he used to be excited about it, right? And what excited him was when it seemed superior to the bored, sprawling, and swollen towns beyond the Ohio. That's the Ohio River. And so... There's something, there seemed to be something exciting about the East and something boring about the West, okay? But after Gatsby's death, the East was haunted for me, distorted beyond my eyes' power of correction, okay? So it's almost kind of, this is a story of how he fell in love with the East and how he fell out of love with the East. We have a couple things to wrap up, though. And one thing he has to wrap up is his dealings with Jordan, right? Look at what he says here. He says it, it, it was going to be an unpleasant conversation with Jordan, and maybe it would be better to just leave it alone. But he says he wanted to leave things in order and not just trust that obliging and indifferent sea to sweep my refuse away, right? So, I mean, that's not a very nice way to talk about Jordan. I mean, when he's saying my trash, he's kind of talking about like the trash or the detritus of his life, right? Okay, so he and Jordan talk and, you know, basically he's saying, look, that, you know, we're done and 
you know, she's fine with it. She says she's engaged to another man. He doubts that, but he knows she could be get married. And then he decides, look, he, he wonders if he's making a mistake, and then he decides, look, I, I, I just got to go, okay? But it really threw her for a loop, right? She's not used to being turned down. This is a girl who's used to getting what she wants, and she's not used to Nick turning her down. They come back, then Jordan brings up this conversation about driving that they once had. Remember, Nick once accused her of being a careless driver. And she said that, oh, that's fine. I can be careless. I'm counting on other people not to be careless. And it takes two careless people to make an accident, she said. And look at, look at how she has held on to this conversation. You said a bad driver was only safe until she met another bad driver. Well, I met another bad driver, didn't I? Whoa. So what's she saying here, guys? She's saying that Nick was careless. She's saying that she's careless and she always tried to be around careful people. And that's why she liked Nick, because he was careful. But now it turns out, she doesn't think Nick was so careful at all. She thinks he was reckless, a bad driver, as in the driver of life, right? It was careless of me to make a, such a wrong guess. I thought you were a rather honest, straightforward person. I thought it was your secret pride. Wow, this is the... Look at what she's saying to this guy. This is the guy who told us he's the only honest person he's ever known. The last thing he says to her is, I'm 30. I'm five years too old to lie to myself and call it honor. Wow. Okay. All right. That's the end. That's the end of Jordan and Nick. Okay. Now, one afternoon late in October... Uh, Nick runs into Tom, okay? Now, this, now, I gotta say, I'm just trying to sort it out here. I'm pretty sure this is not two years down the line, right? This is, so, it, this must still be in 22. I don't think this is in 24, okay? Nick is not eager to see Tom. He says, you know what I think of you. Right? And then he asks, Tom, what did you say to Wilson that afternoon? All right. Remember, we're not talking about the afternoon, the day of the accident. We're talking about the next day, right before Gatsby was killed. Tom stared at me without a word, and I knew I had guessed right about those missing hours. Remember the missing hours, guys. That was the time the police couldn't account for George. The last time people saw him was at noon, and then at around 2.30, he turns up his Gatsby's and, and they hear shots. Okay? So, Nick suspected what was happening during those missing hours, and now he knows. Wilson saw Tom. Wilson came to Tom's house. He came to the door while we were getting to ready to leave, right? Tom and Daisy are trying to skip town, and they're smart too. Wilson has come over to their house, and he's got a gun, okay? He was crazy enough to kill me if I hadn't told him who owned the car. His hand was on a revolver in his pocket every minute in the house. And then he said, what if I did tell him? That fellow had it coming to him, right? Now here, that fellow is talking about Gatsby. He threw dust in your eyes, just like he did in Daisy's, but he was a tough one. He ran over Myrtle like you'd run over a dog and never even stopped his car. Whoa, couple interesting things there, right? First of all, Tom feels like Gatsby deserved it, right? He was trying to take my wife. He threw dust in your eyes. Basically, that's an expression for saying, you know, it's like blinding someone, right? It, it confused Daisy's vision, and it confused your vision too, Nick. The other important thing we learn here, though, is Tom doesn't know Daisy was driving. It doesn't seem like Tom knows Daisy was driving. Okay? 
All right, and then Tom goes and tries to, you know, play the victim here, and he's like, oh man, how sad it was when I went up to that flat and saw that damn box of dog biscuits, right? Talking about the apartment um, where he and Myrtle were together. So, Tom, again, you know, always playing the victim. Here is another, there have been so many memorable lines in this novel, but here's another one that just has always stood out to me. It was all very careless and confused. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other pe people clean up the mess they had made. You know, when you think about this and you think about the way the uber-rich handle their wealth, they're just allowed to be careless. They almost behave like Greek gods, where like nothing matters to them really, because they have the money to clean it up after, to pay somebody to clean it up. I can't, I can't help but feeling like as we're coming out of our, you know, kleptocracy in this country right now, like there was that same kind of carelessness on the part of the, the ultra rich, right? Like, you know, who cares what a mess we make? Somebody else will clean it up. Anyway. We now get to the final scene. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So the the scene encountering Tom in October has to still be in 22. Yeah, it has to still be in 22. So Tom and Daisy left, but they came back soon after. Okay? Because now here we're talking about uh, Nick's last walk over to Gatsby's house before he left after that summer. All right? And... We, uh, so we're, we're now in, uh, we're now in the fall, and of course in the fall, the Hamptons basically closes down, because nobody really wants to be in the beach, at the beach in a New York winter. So, all the big shore places are closed, there's hardly anybody out, and interestingly, Nick starts to think of what Long Island sound and Long Island must have looked like to the Dutch sailors' eyes. The Dutch sailors were the first ones who settled New York. That's why you have places like New Amsterdam in New York. So uh, you have, so he's starting to think about what Long Island looked like to the colonizers, right? So think, look, look at this moment that he imagines. He's like, for a transitory enchanted, enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, right? That, I mean, think about it, guys, in the 16th, 17th century to arrive and to find this new continent, right? Basically, as far as they could tell, untouched forests, brush, all of that. Oh, here we are. We're getting to the end. So notice that 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 context there, that historical illusion kind of brings this American dream not only into the, the present moment of Gatsby in 1922, but into the past of those colonizers, right? Always looking for this new promise, this new opportunity, okay? And there, Nick thinks about this old unknown world, and he thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him. Somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city, where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night, Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Now, at this point, I don't want to, you know, give my lecture on this conclusion. We'll do that in class. But I do want to share here just 
this basic conclusion that Nick reaches about what doomed Gatsby, right? Gatsby was doomed because he followed this dream, a dream that seemed so close that he, was, he, he couldn't miss it. But what he didn't realize was that the dream was already behind him, right? The dream was already behind him. We look to a future. We look to create a future that year by year recedes before us, right? We are always trying, like, I want to be better. I want to be richer. I want to be prettier. I want to be more handsome. I want to be more successful. But year by year, that future gets farther and farther away of, from us. But it's no matter because we keep chasing it, right? Gatsby kept chasing it. We all keep chasing it. And so we are boats against the current. We are basically trying to row our boat against the stream. Wow. I can't wait to talk about this with you guys in class. That is the end of the great Gatsby, formerly named Tremalchio in West Egg. This is Dr. Vela signing out.